Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. What a joy it is to be in your house. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for healings already in this place. Thank you for the Spirit of God in this place. Thank you for reviving our hearts, for restoration, God, physically as well as spiritually as we encountered tonight, God, that uh, demonic spirits are coming off of people, spirits of depression, God, and, and, uh, and Lord, those demonic uh, sicknesses and hindrances, Lord, as well, those physical ailments that come against people in the natural. Father, we thank you for the great testimonies, God, that only you can do. And tonight, only you can speak to our hearts. Only you can make the word of God come alive. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for our brothers and sisters, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, many uh, churches are having midweek services. God, we bless them. God, we bless all of our brothers and sisters. Bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. God, we thank you for Calvary Chapel Harvest, for Oak Valley, for the well and the way. God, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist. God, uh, for victory and for the assemblies, God, the four square denominations, God, we thank you, Lord, uh, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, the Messianic Jews, God, all those that are lifting up the name of Jesus as Lord, preaching his truth, God, we bless them as you would bless us this day. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, we say, amen. amen. Tonight, grab a seat, get your Bible out, and find the book of Leviticus, okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We're going to launch from there uh, today, and we're, we're going to cover a lot of ground throughout the Bible. I wanted to start with, with just a little something here, and this is kind of a neat thing. A friend of mine gave this to me, and uh, I'm, I'm looking to see if he's here. Okay, if, if, Doug, if you're here, don't yell out what this is. Okay, anybody know what this is? Geode? Rock? Who's brave enough to come touch it? Come on, come on up. Come on up here. No? Okay, you, you want to come on up and touch it? All right. It's pretty heavy, okay? He actually said that he got this out of the ground. He pulled it up out of the ground at Trona. All right, hold on. Let me get to you the microphone here. All right. This is my friend Yvonne. Hi. I didn't recognize you for a second there. All right. Okay, so go ahead and hold that. Go ahead. Is it heavy? Oh, my goodness, no. No? Not that heavy? All right, okay. What, what do you notice about it? It um, has... Straight edges. Straight edges. Okay. It's lumpy. And lumpy. Hard. Lots All right. of colors. Sparkly. Lo sparkly. All right. What do you think it is? I think it's a rock. It's a rock. Okay. What, what type? Do you know? <laughs> a crystal. A crystal? Okay. It's a type of crystal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you can classify. You know what it is? It's yeah. salt. I taste it. You, taste your fingers. <laughs> taste your fingers. Oh, it's yeah. It's salt, right? Okay. Cool. Thank you, Yvonne. Everybody give her a hand. Appreciate you being brave there. Yeah, uh, I, I preached a message and talked about uh, the salt, and, and he, he brought this to me. He said, I hope you think this is as cool as I do. And actually, I do. I've got this in my, in my office. And um, he said, you know, all I had to do was put some mineral oil on it to keep it uh, nice and shiny. But I kind of like the saltiness, and, you know, I like being able to, to, to taste it. So um, don't lick this after church, please. I'd like to keep it. But anyways, tonight I want to talk to you about something called the covenant of salt. Find it in your Bible. Uh, you're there in, in Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 13. Okay, we're going to take a look at that. We see this term in the book of Numbers as well as in Second Chronicles called the covenant of salt. God says that the heave offerings and, and the offerings that were given to the children of Israel were with a covenant of salt. Also, when talking about King David, he said that I gave King David a kingdom according to a covenant of salt. Now, that covenant is spoken of both, both, in both of these terms as a covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is simply this. It's a binding agreement. It's the closest, most solemn, and sacred of all contracts. Uh, we would think of covenants today as legal documents. You think about when you buy a house and they break out that brick of documents that you have to sign in triplicate a thousand times and you have to initial 10,000 times and then you have to prick your finger and give some blood at the end, right? And, and, and so we would understand that as a covenant as well when you're, you're buying a car and they roll out the mile-long document. You know, that is a covenant that you agree to purchase the car for a certain price. You're going to pay a certain amount every month, and if you don't, it goes back to the bank, right? Now, the best example that we could see of a covenant in today's terminology 
would be that of marriage. Two people, right, from different backgrounds coming together, and now there is an agreement between them. They're saying, I'm giving my entire life to you. Why? Because I love you. And therefore, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. But not only that, everything that I have is now yours, and everything that you have is now mine. Okay? Okay. And, and, and what do they do? They, they have a ceremony. They, they speak a vow. They, they have oaths that they say, right? And then afterwards, they celebrate with a memorial meal. They have gifts that they exchange to one another. There, there's a giving of oneself to each other in the consummation, okay? And, and, and so we see all of that as covenant terminology. Did you know that when you gave your heart to the Lord that it was a covenant? If you said yes to Jesus, there was a binding agreement. There was a contract signed in heaven, sealed with the blood of Jesus now. And now there's an agreement that God says that because of what Jesus did on the cross, if you agree to the terms of the covenant, giving God all of your heart and all of your life, and now you are born again, right? God makes you brand new because you believed in God's terms. You said yes to Jesus. Now God comes and you are born again, and now you're not your own. You were bought with a price. There's a contract that was signed by the blood of Jesus, and now it's sealed with the Holy Spirit, wrapped around you. And God gives you gifts. He gives you his spirit. He gives you his power. He gave gifts unto men. And there's a celebration going on in heaven every time somebody gives their heart to Jesus. But God is saying that there is a covenant of salt. You say, well, what does that mean? We're going to find out what that means. Leviticus chapter 2, verse number 13 says this. I got salty taste in my mouth now. I'm... Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, and every offering, everybody say offering, Offering. of your grain offering, you shall season with what? Salt. You shall not allow the salt to the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, I want you to notice something. He says, I I don't want you to leave the salt out. You got to keep it in there. Every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with. With salt. Now, the grain offering also in the old King James is called the meat offering. Really, uh, what they're talking about in meat was, was to have meat with somebody. You were going to have a meal with somebody. You were going to sit down and fellowship. We understand this in the New Covenant terminology when we have communion, right? There's, of course, the cup of the New Covenant in his blood, right? But also we have the what? We have the bread, right? And, and this was a picture in the Old Covenant of communion, of that sharing a meal, that fellowship that we have with God, that now when we connect with God, we connect with him on this level of intimacy. See, when you sit down to share a meal with somebody, what happens? Fellowship, right? Now, now there's, you're, you're talking. You're enjoying a meal. You're, you're, you know, there, there's people that are called foodies nowadays. You heard of the foodies, right? And, and their whole life is spent going out and trying new foods and tasting new things, you know? And they actually have a, a group of people. There's, there's food blogs. There's a food network on television. There's all sorts of stuff surrounding food. Why? Because it brings us into communion with one another. It brings us into community. And when you share a meal with somebody, now it's like you're sharing a part of your lives, See, whenever you have friends that are close, what do they do? They go to each other's houses and they eat, right? Or, or they're, they're double dating. What are you going to do on a double date? Well, we're going to go eat, right? Why? You got to eat, you know? But also, there's something that happens at the table when you start breaking bread together. This offering signified our closeness, our fellowship with God. And he says, I want you to season it with salt. Don't just bring bread to God. Don't just bring the meal to God. You got to season it with some salt, What else did he say? He says, you shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking in your grain offering. Tonight, maybe you came into this place and you said, something's lacking in my relationship with God. Something's lacking in my life. I I don't know what it is. I've been doing this Christianity thing for a while. And you know what? When I started, it seemed like everything was amazing. It seemed like electricity. It it seemed like I just had things going on. Anybody ever feel that way? You know, you you started out and it was like this bang. Everything was new. Everything was crazy. You were learning so much. And all of a sudden, you kind of hit a plateau in your walk with God. There's something lacking. Maybe tonight I could submit it to you that maybe what's lacking is salt. And he says, with all your offerings, you shall offer salt. If you're going to bring something to the Lord, if you're going to do something with God, if you're going to live this life, don't live it without salt. Because there's power in it. See, this covenant of salt spoke of an agreement that was now sprinkled with salt. See, the agreement by itself would have been enough. It's the closest, most enduring, solemn, sacred of all contracts. It's binding. It's an agreement. God is into it. But God says, I don't want you to leave out the salt in your offerings. I don't want to have it lacking. 
See, with David, it was a covenant of salt. What does that mean? That meant that it was enduring, right? That meant that it was incorruptible if it had salt with it. Same thing with the offerings that the children of Israel brought to God. It was now a covenant of salt. It was enduring. It was supposed to be perpetuating. That means going on and on and on and on. And it was incorruptible. We'll talk about that tonight as we go on. See, don't allow salt to be missing from your life. It should be in every area of your life. We should have salt, that seasoning of life. It should be all over the place. We should be the saltiest people on the planet. Are you, are you listening tonight? Okay, thanks. A couple of salty dogs out there. All right, it's good. So tonight, what power is there in the covenant of salt? If we're going to live this life, if we're going to figure out what this is all about and maybe get into some practical things for our lives, what power is there? See, it's one thing to say salt, and you could go out of this place and be totally confused and say, Pastor Dan is crazy talking about salt. But there is power in a covenant or an agreement that's seasoned with salt. A couple of things that I want to talk about that all start with the letter P, okay? First one is this. What power is there in the covenant of salt? Number one is purifying. Purifying. Salt is a cleansing agent, you ever poured salt in a wound? What happened? Youch, right? That's where we get the statement like pouring salt on a wound. You know, it's, it's almost like a bad situation went worse. But can I tell you something? Salt actually is a purifying agent. Now, I'm not saying to pour salt on your wounds, okay? You might want to go and get something a little bit more gentle, uh, rinse it with water, you know, cleanse it with soap or something like that. But... If you look in medical science today, and, and, and my, my doctor friends on the front row, uh, they use salt in a lot of the new medications. They use it, uh, right, saline is a type of salt, right, that sort of a thing. And they use that for nasal rinses and different things like that. Is that true? Or am I just talking the wrong things here? No, we're, we're good. Okay. So my doctor friends are confirming it over there. All right. They, thanks for not making me look foolish up here. Appreciate that. But even if it stings, it's still making things better. Sometimes the pain helps us to know that it's working. Are you listening tonight? And salt is that purifying agent. And even though it may heighten the sense, almost like when you burn your tongue and then you, you, know, you eat a jalapeno or something like that, same thing with a wound. It's going to hurt, and then you pour salt in, it's going to hurt even worse because the pain receptors are already aware. But that cleansing power of salt, it can actually purify. That's why they have the saline pools now. That's why they have saline solution. You can clean your eyes with it. You clean your nose with it because it's a purifying thing. Interesting story in 2 Kings chapter 2. Turn there with me. 2 Kings chapter number 2. And I want to take a look at verse number 19 through verse number 21. 2 Kings chapter number 2. Starting in verse number 19, we find the prophet Elisha. Elisha is the uh, one who took on the mantle of Elijah, right? So Elisha is coming along, and he's starting his ministry. In verse number 19, it says this. It says, the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of this city is pleasant. Everybody say pleasant. Life is good, right? The city itself is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is bad, and the ground barren. Now, how many of you know a pleasant city with bad water and barren ground is not a good combination, right? That city's not going to be pleasant for long because somebody's going to say, I'm hungry. Someone's going to say, I'm thirsty. So even though the city may be pretty, it may be situated up on a hill, it may have a great view, it, it might be uh, very clean, and the, and the streets and all that kind of stuff might be good, and, and you know the infrastructure and all that may have great organization, a great government, all that going on for it, and yet, if you've got bad water and you've got bad ground that's not producing anything, you might as well get up and go to the worst city with good water and good ground. Are you hearing me? Why? Because you're going to die sitting there. Oh, it's a pleasant city, but oh, man, I'm hungry. Well, this place is great, except that I'm going to die of thirst in the next two days. See? So they said, that the city's pleasant, but the water's bad, and the ground is barren. Verse 20. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Now, i got to be honest with you. I have read this story for years. And every time I read this, throughout the years, I would say, I don't understand what is going on. 
why when they start talking about the water and they start talking about the land, does he say, bring me a new bowl with salt in it? Look at what he does. Verse number 21, then he went out to the source of the water and cast the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. Now, let me just make sure that you understand what I'm going to say before I say it, okay? The salt in itself, even though it has a purifying value, just casting salt into water is not going to do anything but make the water a little bit salty, okay? It's not the salt in this story that made the difference. It's the word of the Lord that made the difference. Hello? Okay, so, so when I'm talking about salt, I want you to realize that we are using it as an example of things that take place in our life. That's why the covenant is of salt, not physical salt that we can touch with our hands, but the covenant is seasoned with the word of God, with the truth of God's word. So he says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from it. There shall be no more death or barrenness. In other words, that salt was a symbol of the purifying value of the word of God coming in. See, the city may be pleasant, but if there's no water and there's no food, you're gonna die. And yet man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And therefore God says, whatever I speak, whatever I say, bring that into your life. Season your life with that salt. Allow it to come on the inside of you and purify you. Allow it to get in you and through you. And therefore, when your life has that value in it, it will purify and cleanse. Sometimes it's going to rub you the wrong way. Sometimes when you hear the word of God, you ever had this happen? You come into church? I've had people meet me at the back door. Pastor Dan, you took me out behind the woodshed this morning. And I said, what did I do? I just preached the word. And they said, exactly. Man, God just got my number. You must have been in the car with us on the way to church because you were talking about me today. Anybody other than Pastor Dan ever had that happen, right? It's like you came to church and you said, the preacher has my house bugged. He was talking about stuff that we were saying in whispers in the inner chambers, and yet here he is airing my dirty laundry out in front of everybody. What's going on? I'm going to some other church. And yet, what is God saying? The word of God is that salt that he pours into the wound that even though it might hurt, even though it might rub you the wrong way, even though it might make it look like you just made a bad situation worse, it's purifying, it's cleansing, it's getting rid of the infection, it's taking away those things that would harm you. You will no longer be barren, nor will you be unfruitful. The word of the Lord stands forever. Hallelujah. So good. So cool. See, it has a purifying value. To illustrate this, I'm rolling with illustrations. Who, who has a wound they'd like me to pour some salt in? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. See, when you get God's covenant promise, you know every word of God is a covenant. See, sometimes we don't realize God is speaking covenant, and yet he is. Remember when he said, let there be light? Remember when he, he formed the earth, right? He spoke the planets into existence. He, remember when, he, when he, he created two lights, one to govern the night and one to govern the day? You know, later on you find in the book of Jeremiah, he says, if you can break my covenant with the sun and the moon. I'm sorry, when was that, God? I don't remember you making a covenant with the sun and the moon. Oh, yeah, when he spoke into existence. That was covenant. And he says, now if you can break my covenant. In the same way, every word from God stands true. Why? Because God cannot lie. Therefore, when God speaks something, it is as good as a covenant. It's binding. God is bound by his word. Now, some of you guys are excited about that and happy about that, but some of you guys don't know what that means. That means that when God says he's going to bless you, hello, he has to bless you. If God says he's going to save you and he's able to keep your soul from hell, he has to save you. That means that if God says he's going to deliver you, he has to deliver you. But see, you say, well, then, pastor, why am I not blessed? Pastor, why don't I feel safe? Pastor, why, why haven't I been delivered yet? Here's why. Because you need to bring that salt into your life. It's a covenant of salt. You need to get a hold of the covenant promises of God and put them in your life. You say, how do I do that? Here's how you do it. You speak it. You believe it. You declare it. You talk about it with your wife. You talk about it with your children. You tell your neighbors, your coworkers, your relatives about it. You let people think you're crazy, but yet God has to look after his word, and therefore when you speak it, when you declare it, when you believe it, when it goes forth from your mouth, when you say, God, this is a promise from you. I'm standing on the word of God. I don't know how. I don't know when I don't know why but God I just know it's coming God has to perform his word 
See, barrenness comes from badness. Are you listening? You say, I'm unfruitful in life. Maybe you've been bad. Maybe it's time to put salt and allow it to purify you from that badness. What does that mean? Clean up the act. Allow the word of God to get on the inside of you. Not just behavior modification, but a heart transformation where I no longer want to do that old stuff. Why? Because I'm being cleansed by the word. I no longer look at that stuff. Why? Because I made a covenant with my eyes not to look on any young maiden. I no longer say those things. Why? Because every word that comes out of God's mouth is a covenant. Therefore, I'm going to be a man or a woman of my word. And my my yes will be yes. My no will be no. I'm going to put away lying like the word of God says. I'm no longer going to do that. See, and it's a process. Believe me, I, I mess up all the time, okay? Let's just be honest and transparent in this place. I'm not perfected. I have not arrived. And yet... I am speaking the word of God and I'm going from one glory, that old glory, I'm that old man, to a new glory, to the glory of God. I'm going from strength to strength, from faith to faith. I'm going on and I'm going up. Why? Because of the power of the word of God. We're all in this together. We can do this. See, barrenness comes from badness, but purity brings fruitfulness. See, when you've been cleansed of that old man, when the word of God gets on the inside of you, there's no room for darkness any longer. See, when the light of God's word gets on the inside, now there can't be any more darkness. Are you listening? And out of that pure heart, out of that purity, comes fruitfulness. God will bring forth the things that you're believing for in life. So, what is the power? What power is there in the covenant of salt? Number one is purifying. Number two is this, preserving. Preserving, maybe you know this, but salt is a preservative, right? You can use it to preserve items. They used to use it on meats, right? They'd be taking travels of a long distance. They'd dry out meats and they would put salt on it. In fact, who didn't have dinner on their way here tonight? Okay, Laura, you didn't? Do you like beef jerky? John says yes. What say you? Yes, come here, Laura. Come on. Laura works with our Kids Rock, the Children's Learning Center. She is absolutely wonderful. Come, come on up. Come on up here. Here, let me get you the mic. Okay, get up in the light here. All right, we'll give you the mic here too. Okay, this is Jack's, Jack Link's premium cuts. Do you like teriyaki? Yes. Okay, teriyaki. That, anybody else like teriyaki? You might want to ask Laura if she'll share afterwards. <laughs> now, I want you to know something. Okay, Ritz crackers have roughly 210 uh, milligrams of sodium in them, okay? okay? Um, uh, sun chips, 250, 260, somewhere around there, okay? That, that's pretty salty snacks, right? You know how much salt, beef jerky, can you read that right there? How much does that say, sodium? Need your big glasses? Uh, oh, gosh, is it 750? 750 wow. milligrams. Now, now, Laura, you didn't have <laughs> dinner because you were working, so would you like, here, here, I'll take the mic, you go ahead. Just a little, because that has so much salt. Just a little, because no, salt, I, I tell you what, here, take this back to your seat. You can eat that because you didn't have dinner, and share with John, okay? Just, just one piece for John, though, because he had dinner, I think, all right? <laughs> Love you, Laura. Thank you for that. 750 milligrams of sodium in Jack Link's beef jerky. Hallelujah. See, that's, that's a preservative. What's it doing? They dried it out, and now that salt is keeping it from going bad. You're there in Second Kings still? 2 Kings chapter 2. Take a look at the next verse, verse number 22. Take a look at what it says, right? He, 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 he gets the new bowl. He gets the salt in it. He pours it into the waters. He says, thus saith the Lord, from now on this water will no longer be bad, nor the land be barren, right? Okay, verse number 22. So the water remains healed to this day according to the word of Elijah, which he spoke. Look at that. What's he saying? He's saying that the word of the Lord preserved that water to the day of its writing. And, and can I tell you something? I believe that if we knew where this was, if we could go back and we could find that place, the water would still be good and the land would still be fruitful according to the word of the Lord. Why? Because the word of the Lord stands forever. You know that the word of God will preserve your life. It will keep you from stumbling. It will keep you from sin. It will keep you from peril. It will keep you from famine. It will keep you from the sword. It will keep the devil out of your life. It will keep you strong. It will keep you healthy. It will keep you vibrant. It will keep you youthful. It will keep you sharp. It will keep you mentally able. It will keep you focused. See, the word of God is a preservative. As you season your life with the salt of God's word, as you get the promises of God and that covenant in your life, and you declare the word of God, it will preserve you. A thousand may fall at 
at one side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near your dwelling. Why? Because you are in covenant with Almighty God. You rest under the shadow of the Almighty. You dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Why? Because Yao, you are in that covenant of salt. You remember Abraham? Genesis chapter 18, you don't have to turn there, but you remember Abraham, right? Talking to God, they just had a covenant meal, okay? Now, after they have the covenant meal, God's about ready to go off, and he says, basically, to the two angels with him, hey, shouldn't I tell Abraham what we're about to go do? You know, he's my friend, so I'm paraphrasing now, right? He says, my friend, uh, shouldn't I tell Abraham? So he comes back, and he says, I'm about ready to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Judgment is coming on them. Fire is going to rain down from heaven and destroy the cities. Now, Abraham knows his nephews down there and his family is down there. So what does he do? He says, Lord, I, I just got to speak up here. I'm so sorry, but God, would you, would you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? Far be it from you. You're, you're God, and you're good. You wouldn't do that, God. So if there was 50 people there, would you destroy the whole city if there were 50 righteous? God says, no, I wouldn't destroy the city if there was 50 righteous there. He says, okay, God, but um, you know, I, I just, just in case, you know, what, what about if there was five less? God says, I won't, I won't destroy it for 45. Abraham talks him all the way down to 10. God, what if there's 10? What, what if, God, I, I know I'm just a man. I'm just dust. I, I'm not worthy. Don't be angry with me. But God, what if there's 10? God says, for the sake of the 10, I will not destroy the land. Now, we know the story. There wasn't 10 in Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Because the judgment came, an angel had to grab Lot by the hand and pull him out. His wife turned into a pillar of salt because she turned back and she was forever preserved in that state because the judgment came. And yet, I want you to notice something, that it was the righteous influence in that city that would have preserved that city. I've heard people saying there's no hope for America. I've heard people saying there's no hope on the earth. I've heard people that fear ISIS more than they fear God. And yet I'm here to tell you there's a whole lot more than 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 in this room. This place alone could preserve this nation. And yet all over the world there are millions upon millions of Christians that are the salt of the earth. We are the preservative. We are the ones who can stand in the gap. We are the ones who can stand and proclaim the word of the Lord. We can do it without fear, and we can do it with boldness. Why? Because we will be preserved. Everything can fall down around us, but I'm standing strong. I remember when the fires ripped through northern San Bernardino. You guys remember that, the old fire? That couple years, right? Uh, Del Rosa and all those neighborhoods just were tore up. I remember there was a family in our church. We did a video on it and everything. And man, their fence was charred, their, their, their grass on the edges, the tree, you know, some of the tree branches, but the house itself didn't even have the touch of fire on it at all. Let me tell you something, the word of God will preserve you in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the flood, in the midst of the famine. God will protect you. God will take care of you every day of your life. Last one for today, we talked about what is the power? What is the the power of the covenant of salt? Number one, it was a purifying power. Number two, it was a preserving power. Last one for today, last one for today is this, potency. Potency, I like this one. See, salt has a flavor, right? Salt is a savory item. You heard of the sweetness, right? Now, now, in that offering, if you read in Leviticus chapter number two, you'll find out that the offering had specific things. It needed to be fine flour. It couldn't have any leaven. And it said you shouldn't offer it with any honey. Now, you know what that speaks of is the influence of the world, really. There is a passing pleasure of sin like the sweetness of honey that can come along, and that, that leaven as it gets in there, it infiltrates the inside. In fact, you, know, you, you won't really find in the Bible, and a case could be made in the book of Matthew chapter 13, I guess, a case could be made of the influence of the kingdom going in like leaven, but really, when you look throughout the Bible, you will find most of the time that leaven was looked down upon when it came to the things of God. They had to, before Passover, sweep all the leaven out of their house. What were they doing by doing that? They were saying they were getting the worldliness out of their lives. There was a a purifying, and then what did they do? They had the Passover lamb. There was a preserving. But let me tell you something. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were potent. 
They were strong. They plundered Egypt on their way out. They were strong. They, there was a, a taste that was left in the Egyptians' mouths afterwards because why? They were the salt. And it's the same thing with Christians today. See, we are not to offer our lives with any leaven, any mixture of this world or the passing pleasure of sin. This is not just lip service to God. Oh, God, I love you. Oh, God, I praise you. Oh, God, you're so good. And then we go out and we live like the devil. Come on, somebody. This is not just a, oh, I'm blessed, bless the Lord, brother and sister, so-and-so, you know, and then we get out of here and we get in the car with our families and every foul word comes out of our mouth. No, we are to be an offering that is of fine flour, pure, with no leaven and no honey. This is not the passing pleasures of sin in our lives. When you bring your life to God, and yet he says, don't forget the salt. Make sure that you have that seasoning in yourself. You guys remember in Matthew chapter Number five, Matthew chapter number five, verse number 13. Take a look at it with me. Matthew chapter five, New Testament now, Matthew chapter five, verse number 13. Look at the words of Jesus. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Everybody say, I am the salt of the earth. earth. Maybe you didn't realize it, but you are that purifying agent on the earth. Maybe you didn't realize it, but you are that preserving agent here on the earth. But also, you are the flavor of the earth. Did you know that every scientific, every, uh, you know, artistic, every major thing as you look throughout history, most of the time, when you find cutting edge, groundbreaking, revolutionary, uh, world-shaking ideas and, and things and, 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 and new stuff that's taking place when there's an explosion of art or science or anything like that, Christians, for the most part, are on the forefront. Now, the world's going to tell you, no, that's not true, you know, that's not, but, but take a look. Take a look. Sir Isaac Newton, right? Christian, just take a look in history, right? George Washington Carver, Christian, okay? We could go on and on and on. We could be here all night talking about all of the godly men and women throughout history that were were groundbreaking scientists, that were artists, that were revolutionaries, people who who had wisdom in government. I mean, most of our founding fathers were, were, were godly men and women. And you can see that all throughout history. See, you are the salt of the earth. You are the flavor. You bring something to the table. You, you've got something that the world needs. You can change the atmosphere because you are the salt of the earth. But look at what he goes on to say. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, salt without its savor is like a Christian without Christ. Good for nothing. You know, if you have salt, if this didn't taste salty, you know what this would be? A rock, right? How about this, right? I got a salt shaker here. has some rice in it so that it doesn't get uh, wet or something like that. But if, if I had salt here, right? I got salt in my hand. If that had no flavor, what is that? Sand, right? Might as well go put this in the kids' play area so that they can go walk on it. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if this doesn't have any flavor, why are we carrying it around in little bottles like this? Okay, I got, I got one more illustration. You guys got time for one more illustration tonight? Okay, if, if you didn't, too bad. <laughs> Who else didn't have dinner tonight? Well, up in the back, you didn't have dinner? Do you like carrots? Yeah, come on up. Come on up. Run up here. Come on. All right, now I promise these came from my refrigerator tonight, okay? So these are, these are good, and I, I had clean hands when I put them in here, all right? So I'm going to let you do a little, little taste test for me here, okay? What's your name? Claudia. Claudia, come on up here. Come on up here. Everybody say hi to Claudia. <laughs> here, Claudia, here, take the mic there, okay? Now, Claudia, I want you to reach in there and grab a carrot. Okay, not that one. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You can have that one, Okay. <laughs> Take it, take it, see, she's hungry. She didn't have any dinner, so she is hungry, okay? How is that carrot? Fresh. Fresh, crunchy, tasty. tasty. All right, go ahead. You can eat the rest of that carrot. Not, what's that? You want this one? I want to try something with you, okay? Is this all right? Have you ever had salt on a carrot before? No? Are you, are you interested to see what it does? Okay. I'm just going to give it just one little shake here, okay? Is that good? Maybe two? All right, three? How, how much salt do you like? Enough. Is that enough? Okay. All right. Claudia, go ahead. Okay, are you done with the first one? No. 
No, okay, finish the first. Get, get it out of your system. Get the first one out of your system, okay? First one had no salt. All right, this one is seasoned with salt, okay? You got a clean palate, okay? I'm hungry. You're, you're hungry, okay, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You need to go see Laura with the beef jerky, okay? She'll hook you up, all right? She, she, will, she will take care of you. How, how is that with the salt on it? It tastes better. What, I'm sorry, can you say that into the microphone? It tastes better. It, it tastes better? Can carrots taste better? They can? A little bit of salt on it, right? I didn't put too much. It tastes good? Perfect. Perfect. Look at that. Thank you, Claudia. You can go back to your seat. Wow. Who would have thought salt would make a carrot taste better? And yet, we see it right in front of our eyes right now. I, Claudia, did I get you before church service and tell you to say any of that? No, no. She was just hungry and came and, and, and was blessed with two carrots. See, we are the salt of the earth. We need to have a, a savor. We need to have a flavor. We need to have Jesus in every part of our life. We should be out there, and we should be making life better. It should be better. See, life can be life. Life can be average, life can be boring, and you can plot along, and yet when you bring Jesus, when you bring that covenant of salt, now you get the promise of God, it's the word of God, now, and you start sprinkling it all around. Everybody around that tastes, right? Take a little taste. You, you've seen that commercial? My kids love the commercial. I, there's a rabbit trail, and I don't know why I'm going there, but I'm going to go there. You've seen the Cinnamon Toast Crunch commercial? Right? It is two little pieces of Cinnamon Toast Crunch in the bottom of a cereal bowl with a little bit of milk around them, and the one just leans over and... Licks the other. <laughs> then he goes for a second lick, and the first one just <laughs> chomps him up, right? We always joke that that's my son, Micah. He licks everything. We're like, ah, that's Micah. He's licking his friend. But, um, <laughs> but see, when people come over and they taste your life, it should taste better than their life. See, because the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is what? Good. And so when they see your life, they should look at your life and they should say, now, uh, wait a second. They, they should be crying right now. Life is falling apart. Everything's going wrong. They're handing out pink slips on the job. Their neighborhood is, is having trouble. Things are going down. I saw the news this morning and yet they come in here whistling a, a tune. What is that all about? And they taste and they say, what's different about you? Why are you smiling? Why are you crazy? And you say, it's the Lord. Right? Right? Shake a little salt out on them. Life is better with Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 4 and 5. 3, 4, 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 4 and verse number 5. We'll end with this tonight. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 4. I'm sorry, 4, 5, and 6. 4, 5, 6. I got the wrong address. Sorry, one page over. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Look at this. Look what it says. Walk in wisdom towards those who are outside redeeming the time. When it says walk, it means live out your life. Live a life of wisdom with people who are outside. What is that? Outside of what? Outside of the covenant. Outside of the agreement. They are not in Christ. They are outside. So walk in wisdom. Live out your life with wisdom towards those that are not believers. Look at verse number five. Verse number six. Let your speech always be with grace. Look at the next words. Seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Just like Claudia, our friend, just showed us how eating a carrot with salt made it taste better. You know, people, everybody's life is different. Everybody that you encounter is going to have a different background, a different story. They're going to have a different thing that's going on in their life. And as you come and you add the flavor, you add the seasoning to their life, it's going to come out, my goodness, that's, that's rich, that's healthy, that's strong. Oh, my goodness, look at this. Look at what's going on over here. Remember one time I was in Amsterdam, I was on a mission trip, and we were there sharing Jesus. We, we did uh, different ministries. We'd go to the major city squares, the city centers. We would put on a performance, sing, dance, all that kind of stuff. And then right afterwards, uh, while we were doing the performance, a crowd would gather up, and our team would surround that crowd on the outside. And when we finished the crowd, we would say, ladies and gentlemen, we're finished with our presentation. We have some friends that would love to talk to you, and we'll be out here to talk to you as well. Now, when the people turned around to leave, there was our team ready to pounce on them, right, and share Jesus with them. And, and at the time, we were sharing with a little booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws. God has a plan for your life. Uh, God loves you. God, God went, Jesus went to the cross and died for you, and you can now have eternal life with him. Four simple principles that we shared with people. And I remember I had this guy that I was talking to. He came over, talked to me, my friend. 
was, was praying for me as I shared Jesus with this man. And as I'm going through, I, I'm sharing, I said, can I share with you four spiritual laws that, that, that could encourage your life? He said, absolutely, you know, let's talk. As we're talking, he says, I'm an atheist. See, I couldn't even get past the first God loves you and has a plan for your life because he says, I don't believe that there even is a God. See, his unique situation, his unique life was, was, was just godless. And so I had to start going into a mode, well, how do you know he's not behind the moon? How do you know he's not in China right now sitting there? How can you be in all places at one time? Can't you at least confess that, that there is the possibility and the chance that there could be a God, you know? And so we start going through this. And as we're talking, we're just going, and he's, he's got this going on. He's got that going on. There, there's this uh, thing from his past. There's this thing from his present. His education is telling him one thing. This is going on. And as we're going, I'm just seasoning the conversation left and right with the salt of God's word. I'm just throwing things in there. But God loves you. But I know that God is real. I know that God loves you. I know that Jesus went to the cross for you. I know that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Don't you want to not wonder about life? See, if you're right, then this is all okay. But if I'm right, you, you're not okay, man. And we, we got the salt going, right? I'm just shaking it on, pouring it on. At the end of it, he smiled at me. You know what he said? He said, I'm a school teacher. I'm going to share this with my class. My goodness, God can even use the mouth of the atheist to tell someone about Jesus. He can use a jackass in the Bible. He can use an atheist school teacher, right? See, let your conversation be seasoned with salt. When you talk to your boss, Use the salt of respect and honor. Use that respect. Use that, that, that hard work ethic. See, when they see that, they're going to respond to that. When, when you're talking to your husband or wife that's not saved, I you know some of you guys have been believing God for a long time, speak with love, right? Husbands, bear with your unbelieving wife as the weaker sex, the Bible says. Wives, with your husband, just, just give them respect. Bring that salt of respect and honor because him not having a word will see your chaste life, your conduct, First Peter chapter three, and him without a word will have the word preached to him. You don't have to bang him over the head with the Bible. You don't have to do anything in the middle of the night and slap him with oil. All you gotta do is live a pure and chaste life before him with godly reverence and fear. That's what this is all about. See, just season it with salt. What did we learn today? A covenant of salt, it's a binding agreement, the closest, most solemn and sacred of all contracts. That salt is, is enduring, it, it's uncorruptible. Three things that we learned about the power that comes with the covenant of salt. Number one, it's purifying. Number two, it's preserving. And number three, it's potency. It is the flavor of life. Isn't God good tonight? Can we give the Lord a praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to talk to some of you guys before you leave this place. It would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, had such a good time worshiping and praising the Lord. It'd be a tragedy if we saw miracles right in front of our eyes, people getting delivered, people getting healed. Some of you guys in this place. My goodness, be a tragedy if we heard the word of God and had such a good time getting something from God. I know you got something from the word of God. Thank you guys for your attention tonight. I could feel you just getting a hold of the word tonight. But it'd be a tragedy if we had such a great church service tonight and we left this place and your heart wasn't right with God. You died and you went to hell. See, you don't get saved just because you come to church. You can't just sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. And yet a lot of times we preachers are kind of foolish and we think that just because people sit in a church service, that means they're all right with God. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. See, I, I could go down to Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, sit in the dugout, wear the uniform, bring my bat and my ball and call myself a Dodger and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a Dodger. And tonight, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian. Some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, I, I understand that, but, you know, I've been a really good person all my life, done a lot of good deeds, helped out, you know, given money to charities, been involved in social justice causes. It's great. I'm glad you did those things. Could you just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you to heaven? You know, in fact, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not going to make it there based on your goodness. The Bible records that our goodness compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. It's going to get thrown out. You're not going to make it just by being good. You say, oh, okay, I get that, Pastor, but, you know, when I was a child my parents told me you were Christians growing up maybe they hung a cross or Saint Christopher around your neck had you baptized a Christian as a child and you went to religious classes like Sunday school or Sabbath school catechism class born in America America's a Christian nation everybody born in America is going to heaven we're not any other religions we're not Buddhist Muslim Hindus therefore we're Christians right wrong did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church parents tell you're a Christian that makes you a Christian no in the Bible say that you wear religious jewelry be baptized a Christian as a child Ten religious classes or be born in America that you get to go to heaven. And, and, and you know, it's, it's not like because you're not some other religion that by default, God loves you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. 
See, if a pastor in my last church, you know, I, I, I got involved. You know, I helped out. I sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. It's great, but you know God's not looking for your volunteer hours or your church involvement for you to get in heaven. Now we're back to good works, aren't we? And yet, a lot of times people think that just because they got involved that they're going to go to heaven when nothing could be further from the truth. Tonight, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. You say, Pastor, I got you on this one. Someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter and uh, the resurrection. I know about Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where that gets you into heaven. Now, where the Bible say that you just know who God is, have some head knowledge about God, or can quote some scriptures or celebrate a holiday, that you get to go to heaven. See, if you'd read your Bible, you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. If you'd read your Bible, you'd read about the devil, knows who Jesus is, and can quote scriptures out of his mouth, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. Everybody look up here at me for a second. Not about what you have in your head. It's not about your mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Have you given God all of your heart, and have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? Jesus said you must be born again. I know our society made a mockery out of that term. They raked it through the coals. Well, listen, let's not let Hollywood movies, books, television, and the internet define for us what being born again is. Being born again has always meant the same thing all throughout the Bible. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are pretty gross and graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity to do just what we're talking about right now, to enter into this covenant, this agreement that God had with the Son, that the Son would come, live the perfect, spotless, sinless life, would die on a cross for you and me, pay the penalty for our sins, and now by faith we can enter into that agreement, and now we can give God all of our heart and all of our life, and He will give us all of His heart and all of His life. Now that means that you're born again, brand new on the inside. You get a new start on life. Here's what we're going to do. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, here's your opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. And you might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Just think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. Moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. No one's that dumb. And yet the devil thinks that you are. That's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Flesh is trying to hold you back. Listen, push past all that tonight. Tell the devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God. Tonight, you can give God all of your heart. You can give God all of your life in this safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure in this place? Come on, tonight you can make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given them all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. Come on, wherever you're at, with the sound of my voice. If you're online, watching across the nation and around the world, this is your time. You can raise your hand. God sees. God watches. He sees your heart right now. And then you can click the button that says, respond to God at the blue button. That's there. How to know God. 
on our homepage. If, you're, if you want to go to rockchurch.com, click that How to Know God. Someone will lead you in a prayer right after this. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go all together. If you need to do this, this is your cue. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high for me if that's you right now. There's one, two, three. Thank you. God bless you. Who else? Who else tonight? There's four. There's five. Got you up there. Thank you. Who else? Five wise people already. Anyone else real quick? Can I have some lights up for a second, you guys? I just need a little bit of lights. They're going to bring that up because I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing. About five or six wise people, if that's you. Thank you. Six, seven. Got you over there. Who else tonight? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. You want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence now. Is there anybody else that I did not already see? There's about five or six, seven, eight. Got you up there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? About eight wise people. God bless you. Who else? Come on, number nine. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Let's go for it tonight. If that's you, I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? We're at number nine. Just raise it up high for me when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you, number nine. Come on, number 10. You were waiting for that round number there. Number 10, come on. If that's you, just raise up your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, number 10. Don't be bashful. Come on, where are you at? Just raise it up high for me if that's you. Anybody else? Okay, forget 10. We're moving past 10. 11. You were waiting for 11. Come on, just lift it up high. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for about nine wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay, need you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. This is your time. We want to pray with you and, and just lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. We want to change destinies with you tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand, all nine of you, or number 10, you should have raised your hand. Number 11, you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. You just come. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. Hallelujah. Hear the Spirit come on, even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come right now. This is your time. This is your moment. Come just as you are. Come and see. Anybody else? Come Anybody else? They're still coming. Come if that's you from the family rooms, you want to bring your children down, you can bring them. Hallelujah. They're coming. Come on. We'll wait for you. They're still coming. We'll wait for you. Anybody else? Come on. Just run down here right now. This is your time. This is your moment. Hey, you guys up front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. A whole lot more than 10 of you up here. I'm excited about that. Either, either I can't count or you heard the voice of God tonight. That's a good thing. Right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel waving at you. He's a good guy. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart, give you some free information, some free literature to read about what just happened in your life. Now that you're a Christian, what do you do next? He'll introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers, and then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. Now listen, give us a year. One year of your life here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center consistently sitting under the teaching. Okay, if you can make it Wednesday nights consistently, come on. If you can make it Sunday mornings, maybe you can't make it Sunday mornings, but you can make it Saturday morning. Maybe you can make it Sunday night. Maybe you can make it to the women's Bible study or, or to the young adults group on Friday nights. Whatever it is, if you can come consistently for one year, get as much as you can at the end of that year and for the rest of your life, I promise you will look around your life and you'll say, I am so blessed. I didn't know it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. You guys make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood 
washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.